Tonight's guest is former chairman of the SCA and current Kaid Ombudsman, Duke Drake, and featuring a live performance by Mistress Ekaterine Tisiliniki from the East Kingdom. Me? Ha ha! I'm your announcer, Master Bjorn of the Northern Sea. And here's your host, Master Laertes McBride. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, well, we're in April already. Hard to believe. Um, so let's kind of get into it. We have a big show tonight, so let's get a couple of the uh, kite-specific stuff. Uh, we're going to get into details on, with our first guest about the announcement that was made by the Board of Directors about the June 1st reinstatement of activities. So um, we'll talk about that later. And as it comes to specific activities here in the Kingdom of Kaid, uh, the Crown and the Kingdom of Sinishal will be having announcements as we move forward. But as we discussed last week with the Kingdom of Sinishal, uh, there is the plan they're trying to make work of uh, having an in-person coronation on July 10th, followed by shortly thereafter of uh, Queen's Champion. But uh, of course, all those are in flux, so write that down in pencil uh, if you actually write down on calendars anymore, um, because we will look for more announcements from the Crown and the King of Sinishaw as those dates approach. All right, with that out of the way, let's bring in uh, our good friend Bjorn, and he'll be here right now. Hello, Bjorn. Hello, Laertes. How are you this week? Uh, well, it's starting to look like spring, um, maybe a little warmer than I would like. But I mean, you know, I I prefer I prefer much cooler climes, which is why, of course, I've lived in Southern California for over twenty years. Yes, uh, yeah, you just like to have perspective, right? And you'll appreciate the cooler climes. Perspective, uh, perspiration, yeah. yes. Yes, and no wool today. I mean, that's a, that's a big step forward too. Yes, there is no wool today. Yes, yeah. lots of linen. So. <laughs> Well, uh, what do you have for us this week when it comes to arts and sciences? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, one of the neatest things about this time of year is how so much of what happens right now uh, has uh, so much in the way of, of medieval perspective. And what I mean to say is we have just come through Lent. We have just had Easter. Uh, and because of all of these holidays and feasts and celebrations that happened during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, um, or the cessation of some of those, uh, depending upon when the, you know, your Protestant Reformation or, or, or of course, thank you, Sir Yaroslav, for reminding me Eastern Orthodox Easter is a, is a different time entirely. Uh, because of all these constant states of, of flux um, within the liturgical calendar, it was sometimes not very easy to keep everything straight. And so one of the neat things that we have uh, had sent to us was um, uh, in medieval-life.net, uh, holidays and celebrations. I, uh, I recommend you get a chance to read this. It has um, both uh, some some very finite details about things. And then there's also just a general overview of everything from Michael Mass in September all the way through the calendar year until um, August. And, uh, and for example, we just finished uh, Easter. Um, but it also talks about other things like uh, uh, the Pentecost or Witch Sunday or um, also a Rogation Day, not Rogaine, Rogation, which is about supplication before the Ascension. And it's um, so it's lifting things up. So it could be like Rogaine uh, for hair follicles, but not. Uh, sorry if that was not appropriate. But at any rate, uh, I recommend MedievalLife.net uh, about the festivals because it's just some neat reading for those of you who are thinking, all right, what celebration will I be able to do when I start going back to events, whenever that is? You can check that out and see which one corresponds to your own personas, um, celebrations or lack thereof. Uh, but at any rate, I recommend that one um, wholeheartedly. Now, the second thing we're going to talk about is really special. Many of you may have already seen that we have coming up very soon, uh, just uh, a little over a month away, the very first 
Bardic War. Now, this is uh, the there's the Facebook group for it, and it it is exactly what it talks about. It is talking about all of the wonderful splendor that we have in mind, uh, what sorts of things will be happening during the war. Um, we are going to be talking about um, what is there to do at the Bardic War and that they're going to be needing judges. They're going to be needing hosts. Uh, they're going to talk about... Um, uh, even uh, for the points, there will also be martial participation. Um, they are also, and this is one of the neatest things I love about this, they made an entire uh, section dedicated to caring about copyright and original pieces by folks that arrange music or that compose music or that write the poetry. This is where you can actually give permission for people to be able to do this stuff. And I have to say that is really fascinating and refreshing. Um, those of you who were watching very carefully during lockdown noticed that there were some people within the society who have had some su success uh, uh, mundanely, had some of their pieces almost taken wholesale uh, to be performed on places like Instagram or TikTok, and through various uh, f fights uh, and and um, just getting the the rights back to the individual who actually created it, uh, they were mostly uh, victorious during this last summer. And uh, the Bardic people that are running the Bardic War know this and want to make certain that everybody is um, is actually made aware of the things that, that they have done, that they have contributed themselves personally. Now, what I also wanted to talk about uh, really quickly is... Um, our, our good friend of the show, Drake Orenwood, has on his uh, website on YouTube a really neat Hamilton parody uh, that talks about the first Bardic War, and it's called The Zoom Where It Happens. Now, rather than me um, play it here, the specific reason why I didn't want to play it here is because I want you to go to his YouTube channel. I want the traffic to go to Drake's channel. So when you are done watching this show, or I guess you could leave now if you wanted, although you'd be missing some really cool stuff, I want you to watch that uh, piece on uh, Drake's website. The Zoom where it happens, it's a Hamilton parody, and uh, in the in the uh, truest sense of filk for the SCA, this is a really, really clever piece. But at any rate, uh, I recommend you get all the information. And if you want to assist as a judge or if you want to be a participant or if you want to talk to the bards of your kingdom to, to see what they're doing, what kingdoms are aligned with which kingdoms, um, check it out, ask around. And I am so excited to have this. I'm looking forward to being there and participating. But more than that, I'm really looking forward to seeing what all these other amazing bards, many of whom we've been fortunate enough to have on the show, are going to be doing next month. So those are the websites that we're talking about today. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for encouraging people to turn off the show, Bjorn. Good job. <laughs> I said they could go now, but they'd miss stuff. Oh, that's but you have to, we have to create a, an informed public. Isn't that the whole reason we started the show? Sure, make me feel bad. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, yeah, and as for uh, hosts of... Uh, games and stuff at the Bardic War, you may see a, a couple of familiar faces there. So just, mm -hmm. and maybe stuff to announce later. Oh, and then the last thing for the festivals and such, uh, my favorite uh, spring is the for uplifting and, and bringing things up is the uh, that uh, every year the, the Rite of Vi Viagra. That's my favorite uh, festival, really uplifting. I think that's called the May or May Not Poll. Oh. It's true. Very nice. Anyway, so on you can't that note, be the only one to do it. I have to occasionally backspin, lob one into your end of the court, right. or people will just think you're you're playing with your. Never mind. Anyway, Never mind. Speaking of speaking of a sturdy poll, uh, who was our first guest tonight? Well, I'll just be talking about Duke Drake, who will be coming on to visit. Oh, oh. Uh, he's going to be talking to us. Uh, he's a former chairman of the board of directors, and he's currently the ombudsman for our own kingdom of Kaid. And so he's going to be coming on to tell us about the most recent decisions made at societal level. Right. <laughs> anyway, let's bring him on. Uh, um, anything, if not classy. Oh, hello, Your Grace. Hi. Great. Thanks for that, that great intro. I really appreciate that. 
And as a, you know, as an older gentleman with thinning hair and other things, you know, Rogaine, whatever, everything else, perfect. Well, we're, we were just going with a the theme. So it's, it's good to see you, Grace. Thank you for joining us. It's good to be here. So as uh, you've mentioned, you're the now former chairman of the SCA, Inc. Uh, when did you step down? Last month. So very Last recently. Month. I stepped up about two years before that. Oh, so uh, you had a very uneventful, oh. straightforward term as chairman, right? I slept the whole time, really. I mean, it was uh, no, it was definitely, um, I had been on the board for about six months before, or uh, six to nine months before I became chairman. Mm -hmm. um, and my mundane position is I'm an executive at a, at a healthcare firm. So, um, which eventually ended up being fairly useful. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I was, uh, I was a chairman for a couple of years. Uh, one of those during that time, of course, we did um, have to uh, close the SCA down for a while. That was certainly the hardest thing I've ever done in the SCA. And I've unfortunately had to do quite a few hard things because of being crowned a couple of times, landed a couple of times and whatever else, but nothing compared, compared to that weighty decision. Um, and then of course, here we are now. And I, and I just stepped down uh, last month uh, from being chairman. I, my board tenure lasts until um, October, but typically you would step down somewhat early, allowing you to be around while the next chairman finds his feet. Now, of course, the, uh, the current chairman, uh, Sir Bartholomew Hightower, has actually been one of your guests in the past, um, is going to far surpass me in chairmanship, I assure you. He's an amazing guy. He is more than we, any of us deserve. He is just amazing. So I, I, he, it's left in much more capable hands than over the last couple of years. Uh, I, uh, I'll take that with a grain of salt. But um, before we kind of get into the position of chairman and some of the challenges you've had, during your tenure, uh, let's talk about the, the guidance that came from, from the sure. board of directors uh, on Friday, right? Talking about, well, Thursday, actually. Uh, talking about looking after the end of May. Can you just do a brief recap on what that guidance was? Absolutely. Actually, the guidance itself, of course, is published, but I can really kind of dig into the kind of process that went behind it, I think, and also yeah. make sure that even right at the very beginning, Note that the Society of Seneschal and the President of the Society are putting together a list of questions that they will be answering publicly in a roundtable in coming week in the coming week or two. Um, I I don't think the actual date's announced yet. Mm -hmm. But so for the if anybody has any actual questions that they want to get out there, want to have, have answered and discussed, that is a great venue for that. Um, but the actual process it's been really really interesting. Now I work in public health, and I I assure you that when we unfortunately had to cease in-person activities i i mean i don't think i or anybody else had the thought that we'd be where we are right now because in at no time in human history has a vaccine or vaccines ever produced in even a small fraction of the time that we've seen it produced i mean usually it takes years and years and years the flu, the first flu vaccine took 24 years um but we're we happen to be in a the modern age. Um, I think they were already working on kind of some coronavirus stuff in the background uh, and all that. So I am uh, overjoyed that in December and January, where we were having the peak months of the entire of the entire um, pandemic, at least here in North America, um, two or three months later, here we are having announced uh, a gradual reopening, a transitional reopening of the SCA. And it is, it is, more than I think any of us could have could have imagined. It's a huge boon, and certainly it's scary for for us and for a lot of other folks. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why we try to be very measured about how you know we've we've kind of constructed the reopening. It's a it's a transitional thing. It is it's flexible, and it's something that will be evaluated and reevaluated as we move forward. But one of the reasons why, and I want to make sure we also discuss this now, is we put it out two months early for, for very good reason, because there are many kingdoms, many groups that are looking to have events and they had no idea. They were in, in, in limbo for June and July, let's say, which are two fairly popular months for, um, for SA events, including many coronations and crown tournaments. We wanted to make sure that um, given the signals that we were seeing in public health, given the, the, the training and all that, we put it out a couple months early um, 
knowing that things are going to be changing over the next two months. In a, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to do that. And we would know more about how things would look when the official, th the last uh, mandate uh, expired, which is the sale of the same date, this, this June 1st. Um, by putting out two months early, it allows for at least these small ev smaller events or important events like coronations and crown tournaments and all that for, for them to, to, to know that, you know, to have some sort of, you know, solid ground in which to plan their events. So, but knowing that and knowing that we, we had to put, out, put it out a couple of months early to allow for that, uh, we also know that we don't know where we'll be in a couple of months, but it, this, the indications are very strong within the public health arena. And we obviously, to, uh, to get to the, the list of different um, components of the reopening, we, we, we did our due diligence. We looked, we talked at length with, with public health experts, with, with folks within the science community, virologists, you know, physicians, um, you know, just a, a, a host of different experts. I, I, I myself, again, work in public health and knowing that one size doesn't fit all. I mean, it, and, and I'll, I'll, I assure you that a lot of the correspondence we've received, and we typically do get a lot of correspondence on this kind of thing, there's been a lot of commentary both ways, right? There's a lot of folks who are very, you know, concerned about what things will look like in June 1st and other folks who think that it should have gone much farther. I guess that might mean we're kind of hitting somewhere in the middle. We have actually certainly have some commentary, uh, you know, that they, they kind of like where it is too. So, I mean, we want to, we want to construct it. So the folks who are concerned will at least have some of their, their, their fears allayed a bit by the at least the transitional elements in the current plan mm -hmm. and the folks that would like to go much farther they hopefully would understand where 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 we're coming from in this in this first set of of list of you know guidance guidances right i mean just just did a couple of notes and just to reiterate sure like you said, to summarize more than anything else you know there, there's a cap of like 150 people all events must be outdoors. Everyone must be wearing masks unless they're eating or drinking. You know, no food, etc. Have on no food stores. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no food boards are served or yeah. Yeah, no buffets. Um, but that's just the starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and as you're saying, even as we get closer to that June first date, there may be some changes that come down the yeah, pipe. I'm not know. sure about, but yeah, when we get into June, of course. Um, and of course, one thing that I didn't mention that I want, I want to mention as well, specifically within the list of mandates is there is there is flexibility built in mm -hmm. because it mentions the allowance for for uh, requests, not necessarily to be granted or not, but I mean, certainly requests mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, request variances of the of the Society Seneschal. So we've really empowered the Society Seneschal and the president of the society to really work on operationalizing a lot of this stuff to, to make it, you know, something that we can all live with while we while we emerge from the dark times we've been in. Right. So like you know, for example, here in, in Kaid, uh, we should be around two hundred people at an outdoor event would be allowed within the state guidance or maybe even the county guidance. So we might be able to petition saying, hey, this, they're letting us do that. You know, but you'll at least listen to it as long as, uh, and there should be supporting documentation to, to, to make a good um, variance request from the board. And that's a great question for the Society of Central and the President on, on the round table. That exact kind of thing. What, how how it'll be operationalized and all that that's a that's that is a perfect a perfect subject for for further discussion right nice pass the bus no i mean nice good answer <laughs> well they are the ones that you know we've uh there are on the hook or whatever right. for for operationalizing it so i certainly don't want to you know okay. undercut them or and all that and know that there's going to be a lot of flexibility and a lot of a lot of societal and health changes not, I mean, not, and not just for the mass of North America, but also just within North America. I mean, there's, been, there's, there'll be some surprises like Texas, where I, where I currently am, is a weird surprise because apparently everybody got it already, and we have a really robust, we for some reason we have a really robust vaccine distribution. So in Texas, I mean, there, there are some, there are some 
um, signals that we have, we're approaching herd immunity because everyone got sick with it. And then we've all got vaccines too. I mean, we have, we've had, you know, people in their twenties and thirties being able to get a vaccine for weeks. Right. So it's for, for whatever reason. So, and there'll be other States that won't be in that, in that position or some in better. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a wild time for a while, but you know what? The fact that we're talking about it now where in no time in human history before this, we would have expected to be for years from now. And hopefully there would have been an SCA at that point. Right. Right. And, you know, um, as much of an inconvenience as it is, I'm sure, for people planning out here in Southern California for Kaid and such, you know, I I, I feel for uh, our Pimsic planners because, you know, they have set May 31st as their date to determine where as their no, go, no. How about go, no, go date? Either way. Um, yeah. And um, so I know that's challenging for them, too. And I know they're in constant communication with the Society of Seneschal, with the president right. and all that, too. So fun stuff. Um, so um, before I kind of get to other questions, we do have a very important question from the viewers. Um, one is, uh, is that a dollhouse behind you? Well, we were just talking about that off screen. That actually is my cat's condo. Now, I would say my cat. It's actually my wife's cat. Notice there are three or four different stories to this condo. There's a hot tub up here. There literally is kind of a hot tub. And there's different, you know, sleeping areas and living areas and all that. I can't say that I was any part of buying the condo because it was here when I got home. And a week later, a cat was in the condo. So we didn't have a cat at that point either. But that's how it worked. Uh, that's nice. Well, well, thank you for answering these pressing questions. Absolutely. From um so the thing, I, I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way at the top to, as um, the process and what lies ahead. So people were pretty clear about it because I know that there were some uh, concerns originally about the guidance. So thank Absolutely. you very much. So uh, serving as chairman of the board, uh, what kind of, you know, in a nutshell, what, what were your responsibilities and, and how much time out of the month, knowing that the COVID year was a, uh, yeah, uh, operation. Uh, did it did it take to actually do that position? Well, like you said, it ebbs and flows. I mean, it certainly flowed more than ebbed for the last year. But um, and just you know, and I like to give amazing amounts of props to the folks on the board, the society officers, and all that, for, because for the last year of that, as you said, almost constant meetings throughout the entire tenure of of that you know, in the beginning, figure out what we're going to do and, you know, different ways to, um, to conserve the society, honestly, but, and then moving forward, you know, with the surprise of the vaccines causing all the, all the numbers to drop, um, many more meetings there. So I think everybody, if you know a society officer, if you know a board member, I mean, give them your thanks because they have worked their butts off to try to get from, where we were to where we are now and moving forward to where we're going to be. But I would say typically the, the workload for the chairman, again, variable, it's a little more than usual because oftentimes you'll be asked to, to, um, to have a little more meetings with the society um, officers, particularly the Seneschal and the president, because the Seneschal and the president and the, the corporate office, you're an ombudsman for them. So you're, you are, you are, this is the, the um, chairman of this of the board um, is like the the overall overseer or whatever of, of those offices. Now, really, just ombudsman, and you know, you kind of act as a as a sounding board and all that. But you do tend to have to do quite a bit more activity when it comes to that. The typical board member still, of course, does quite quite a bit as it is. But there is a lot of of you know you know working with the the infrastructure of the society to do that kind of stuff. There also is a, quite a lot of, of other meetings. If anything odd comes up, the chairman is typically involved. The chairman is empowered to do certain things on an emergency basis. Um, so they do get involved in a lot of that and a lot of other just more esoteric things. And I'll tell you right now, the uh, I said before, the current chairman, uh, Dan Watkins or Sir Bar Bartholomew Hightower of Artemisia is just going to be outstanding and he's been all he's been i think i stepped down last month and he's already hit the ground running and just doing an amazing job but in the typical times the chair the chair is um the standing board for the officers you know kind of a a person that oftentimes will if there's happens to be any kind of 
dispute resolution needed. Oftentimes they'll they'll they'll, uh, they'll um, be able to kind of integrate that into what they're doing and all of that. And but but honestly, if, if you're chair or vice chair and um, of the society, of course, the chairman also runs the quarterly meetings or most all the meetings and all that. But really, to be honest, I mean, the chair and the vice chair are just first among equals. I mean, they're all there. You just have one one vote. You just happen to be the person trying to help me coordinate things. But there there really isn't a huge disparity when you're on the board that you that you have a lot of extra heft or ability to do anything because you are you're all equals. All right. So what's the distinction between you know, we've had uh, his grace Perry Keller on the on the mm -hmm. show talking about it. So the distinction between the president of the SCA and the chairman of the board of the SCA, kind of what's the main difference or differences that you would point No, out? that's that's a great question. Um, the president, um, you know, is really the person who operationalizes a lot of, of the policy the board implement, the, the board puts out there. So the president is, and the presidency, and I'll tell you right now, the presidency and the Society of Central are the hardest jobs in the SCA, in my opinion. Um, certainly, far harder than than being on the board, um, because I mean, you're you're constantly um, translating policy from the board to operationalize it within the society, and vice versa, bringing up concerns or thoughts or ideas from the society in front of the board to try to get a feel for, you know maybe what could be in future policy but as as within the hierarchy of how things work and i certainly didn't know this when i came on the board either uh the board sits on top as a policy making body and a sanctioning body um under under that the the president um operates and um you know he takes his cues from the board and bear killer as to your your comment has been an amazing president, and it certainly has a huge amount of experience in all levels of of the society. Probably, possibly more than anybody has ever had in the history of the society at a high level, making sure things continue to work for the, for all our game. So he deserves amazing credit for that. As does his lovely wife Falada, who has just been amazing as the board secretary for a long time. EA. Um, so, but so the president is is that main. The main uh, focus of of interest from both the board and the and the participants in in, in engaging change or doing whatever the society essential works for the works for the president. So you have the board, the presidency, and the Society of Seneschal. The Society of Seneschal is purely operational for the most part, where the president kind of lives in both places. He helps helps the board craft um, policy at times. Of course, the the board still does, decides. And um, those three different, um, the, those two individuals and the and the board do make up a really large portion of kind of how how the society goes. Okay, okay. Well, I like how you were surprised that I asked a good question. That really made me feel good. Well, I know um, you. From a long time ago, so that's, that's the only reason why. I'm getting back to the Viagra intro as well. So. <laughs> Um, you know what? This is the point of the show where I step away and Bjorn comes in and asks a few questions. So I'll be back. That's Very a good. warning. So your grace, once again, thank you for being on the show this evening. And uh, the first thing I want to ask is um, what exactly does someone do if they would like to uh, put their name forth for consideration to join the board of directors it is a it's a thankless job it takes it's it's a several year commitment but but i'm not trying to talk it down i'm just sure. i want folks to know the gravity of the situation could you please go through the process of what someone needs to do if if they would like to serve the society at that level absolutely and thanks for the time to do this because this is one of the most important things that we do is 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 vote on you know, new members to the board because it is a three and a half year commitment. Typically, you're 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 the um, director elect for about six months or or so. Um, that's typical. I was actually a little longer than that. You can be a little shorter than that too. And then you're on the board for for a few years as well. Um, so I will say that the what what you do is there 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 are ways to not only nominate yourself but nominate others. 
that you think might be a be a, a an exceptionally good uh, board member. Um, if you go to the SCA main page, you can find that. Um, what you typically all you do is need you need to nominate somebody. The the membership folks will will talk to that person and say, "Well, do you accept the nomination?" And if they do, then they'll they'll supply a mundane and SCA resume, and then you'll be put on the board nominees list. The, those that list is chosen from you know from that list is chosen the the interviewees for each for each board member. Now there aren't many board members. There's there's seven overall, seven seats. So uh, oftentimes we'll we'll interview many many people. And oftentimes, I mean, you may just may not you may have a skill set that we really want, but you may not. It may we may be already full of that or or whatever. So I really recommend. I mean, I can't recommend enough that if you feel like you have the skill set and you have the drive to want to be on the board of directors, I really recommend you, you, you volunteer and because it is something it's like I said, it can be thankless. Or it can be actually, I mean, full of thanks. I mean, there is, it, it's not easy. It's, there's oftentimes where people, where folks are not super happy with a decision you make oftentimes for many different reasons. You know, some, some folks will think um, reopening was way too early. And then some folks will think reopening is should be a much larger thing and and not and and be entirely open and everyone else will be in the middle. So you'll get a get you'll get some of that. But I will say again that without volunteers um, volunteering three and a half years of their life to be on the board to help guide the society through through you know whether it be the pandemic or whether it be any other kind of societal or SEA wide changes without the people that give up their time and energy and expertise, we're all sunk. I mean, we really need folks to, to step up and step forward to be able to, um, to continue what we do. Thank you. Um, now, in the before times, so prior to the pandemic, uh, from what I understand, uh, there were quarterly meetings uh -huh. where members of the board would go. I, I think one of the quarterly meetings was always at the corporate office in Milpitas. And then the other three quarterly meetings were uh, staggered in various parts of the known world. And then in between those, there were also uh, conference calls. Is that correct? Yeah, mostly. Um, and, and actually, and it's changed. My understanding is it's changed through over time. So what, when I came on the board, it was typically every other meeting for the most part was in Milpitas, which is where the corporate headquarters is. And the other one would be somewhere, um, somewhere in the, in the known world. That way we're able to closely integrate with the folks there. Kaid was actually a really great time and really enjoyed coming to, to, to do a meeting in Kaid right before the pandemic hit. Um, that's where I met your current Seneschal actually as well. Um, Sir Tiberius, who was just a great guy and really great to meet as well. Um, but yeah, so typically there are those formal in-person meetings that happen four times a year. And then interspersed between those are the formal quarterly meetings that happen, um, you know, staggered intervals in between those. So four, four informal calls, four formal calls and four formal in-person meetings. Now, of course, we haven't met in person since since the pandemic began, so everything we ha has been um, a meeting like this, and of course now, and part of part of what ha we've done over the last couple of years is really try to increase the transparency of the board. Uh, so much so, you know, lots of email blasts, lots of messaging, lot, and 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 even um, putting um, board meetings on YouTube, which actually worked out really well because we had already been planning on doing it for many meetings before that, trying to figure out the technology involved and all that. So we were just about there when the pandemic hit. So we were able to slide very quickly into having um, the board meetings that you see that, you, that you're able to watch, you know, if you have, you know, some need for, you know, some sort of NyQuil or whatever. I mean, if you need, if you have insomnia, then you can certainly watch a board meeting now. Just you can, you can enjoy it with us. The, the transparency that you mentioned is actually leads into my next question, yeah. because um, there are uh, many people uh, in the society, um, especially if it happens near you. Um, they are. Uh, I've always noticed that you've been people have been encouraged and welcomed to attend the open sessions 
of the board of directors. Uh -huh. Get a chance to meet the ombudsman, get a chance to meet the chairman. Oftentimes um, the president's there. Sometimes the society seneschal is there, Renee is there. And, and then, you know, kind of keeping tabs on everything is the executive assistant of the board, uh, Countess Falada. Um, but then there are the closed sessions. Now, um, obviously there are, there are reasons for that, but in this era of greater transparency, how much more is done that is seen on the, on the YouTube videos and how much is still being done uh, as, as any 5013C sure. corporate entity would need to do, um, how much of it is still being done in closed session? I mean, and certainly we're talking about just at the meeting itself because much of the running of the board isn't happening that's only at the meetings, right? So there's there's a lot of discussion happens through, throughout the scope of every week and every month and all that, even when you're not together at a meeting. But I, but to, but to your point, uh, the closed session isn't a meeting. What we call a planning session. Basically, be, being able being able to actually have the meeting and the votes and all everything that happens in the open session is um, predicated upon actually coming to some kind of consensus. Otherwise, it would be days of meeting and nobody wants that. So a lot of the planning sessions are, they do kind of help tee up what happens at the, the, the open, the open sessions, but we are very careful to make certain that any of the actual, you know, important voting and the, any, any, any of the, the conversation that we want to have about societal things um, happen at the open meeting. So because we, we, we want it to be transparent, even before the transparency was a, a big focus of ours. And because I was around when, you know, we, we first came in, we, had, we just start talking about uh, televising, I guess you could say, or YouTubing or streaming. Streaming is what it is. Streaming um, uh, board meetings. Um, the, the ability to have a lot of that, as much business as possible done. Now, like, for example, I think you've already kind of noted it, like there are certain like sanctions. Nobody wants to hear the sanction stuff and all that. It's just, it's just, like you said, there's, there, there won't be a, an organization that has a lot of sanctions talk when it comes, to, it's not fair to anybody involved in the sanction, but you know, that's, that's the main thing that, that gets done almost entirely at, the at the planning session or the closed sessions uh, uh, and we actually open an executive session during during the closed section to be able to do that but for the most part i mean most of that stuff although it's pre-discussed a bit is still discussed during the uh during the open meeting and as, as much as humanly possible i don't know if i answered your question or not it was kind of rambling but but that's what was what it is. Well, essentially, the the thing that most people have been curious about was sanctions, um, and then the, the the for sometimes uh, um, I know that the president in the past has been called upon to run uh, certain programs um, for consideration at the, at various kingdom levels, uh, whether it be how uh, how the wars were being run, whether it was Penzik or or Gulf Wars or. West on tier, uh, and also uh, DEI things, and and then of course uh, sanctions for various uh, activities that are considered inappropriate um, within the structure of the SCA. So those things, people pretty much expect them to be done uh, board only, and then when the decisions are made, then that information is disseminated both at the meeting and then of course in our respective kingdom newsletters. But uh, it, yeah, that's that's basically what folks thought. But I've had enough people to ask. Sure. What exactly is it? And since since each meeting is different, obviously the percentages will be different. And, to, and just, just, to, just to dovetail what you just said, the mm -hmm. DEI is a great example of something that was a work group for many many meetings, and it it, it started coming in right as I came in the board, so I have a pretty good feel for it. A lot of a lot of the of those close of the close section or the 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 planning sessions are really were just informational. They were just training for us. It was just trying to, we're trying to feel how we would want to try to launch that kind of thing. Not really something that you would want to do in, an, in, in, a, in a business meeting because you're just talking and trying to brainstorm about ways to implement certain things and all that. So that's a great example of what would happen at a planning meeting. Um, the, the last question I have is, um, is talking about um, post-board life for you. So um, the people that have been on the board that I have known throughout my time in the SCA, um, 
the board isn't it sometimes it's something they do once sometimes it's something that several years later they will go back to do and other times once they've stepped down from the board they then uh resume their kingdom level offices or, or they do things for a region uh specific uh th the, the things that that called them to the sca in the first place so i have to ask your grace, once you are uh, divested of your ombudsman position, what is it that you intend to do uh, when you are just a, a regular old run-of-the-mill duke, sir? Uh, I will say well, that's – I don't know if you've been put up to this or not, but we have uh, several of my my ex-squires who are now knights and dukes and here locally at, in, in Osteora, where I'm from. They, uh, they bug me incessantly to uh, start fighting again and to come out again and to do, because honestly, before I stepped up to the SCA, uh, to the board, I was lo locally active, but not as much at a kingdom level for quite a little while. Um, I do plan on being able to, of course, interestingly enough, my reemergence from board life will happen about the time of our total reemergence into the society and being able to hug each other and, you know, whatever again as well. So I, I do look forward to being able to take part of that because I think it's going to be an entirely unique experience in the SCA, and I don't want to miss that. And I think that it, if I hope we all treasure it enough. I know I know, I know I've, I beat on it quite a little bit that you know we should be very very thankful that science is somehow in the first time in human history able to give us a, a vaccine to actually solve this in a in a timely fashion, timely fashion, but. It's going to be an amazing time, a renaissance, one might say, um, of the SCA if we let it be, because we're going to be, I think, we're, we're going to learn a lot of what we've learned in venues like this. And by the way, thank both of you for, for putting this on. It's, it's, it's you know, um, Ask the Duke or, you know, Between Two Peers or your show and many other shows that have really kept people going through this you know it's not us it's it's folks like you and content creators that have been able to kind of keep people's enthusiasm going through this these dark times but to answer your question is um i think i will uh accede to the wishes of my uh of my my friends and uh probably hit the field again um let them pound on me to their their great delight for for, for as, as long as I, as my old body can stand it. And just, I really look forward to seeing old friends, meeting new ones and getting more involved, at least within the, my region of Onstura to, uh, to enjoy the Renaissance of the SCA we're, we're about to see. Thank you so very much, Grace. I appreciate you answering those questions, and especially because the board of directors itself is, is, is has almost, um, uh, some give it anything from sinister connotations to um, to murky angelic, pay no attention to the seven people behind the curtain kind of thing. And uh, I mean, it's not lost on anyone that we have 20 kingdoms and then we have DEI and we have, uh, we have local and, and city and uh, state and national ordinances, but only seven board members. So when you're an ombudsman, you're not just an ombudsman of one thing. You you are aware of many hats. And for you and for all the other people that are doing it, we're exceptionally thankful. I am personally exceptionally grateful that uh, you've been working so hard to getting the SCA to be open safely and in a healthy and secure manner. So thank you very much. Uh, much thanks to them. And uh, thank you for coming on this evening and, and giving us this information. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Oh, no, I'm back. Oh, it's like <laughs> a bad penny. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, so uh, just a quick review. You know, you're a former, former chairman, and you're the current ombudsman, and doing a lot of work on it. But I, I want to say those two positions, if you, if you sound them out, sound like a really – uh, lame superheroes, right? You have the ombudsman and the chairman. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Bjorn, what is the name of the game we're going to play this week? This evening's game for his grace is We Don't Need Another Hero. <laughs> so, um, what we're going to do this week, as the audience will play along, is I'm going to name a superhero. And you need to tell me whether or not it is a real Marvel or DC superhero. Now, uh, to, to make it easier and more entertaining at some points, uh, you get two points if you if you just want to guess by the name, 
Uh, you'll get half credit if you want me to give you a brief description of the superhero. So, All right. I got good? this. I you got, got this. this? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if we're going to start, easy one. Uh, she thing. She thing mm -hmm. is Marvel. Okay, and so it is a Marvel. Yes, that is worth two points. Uh, she was a former wrestler that was exposed to cosmic ray radiation and started dating uh, the thing. So just in case you wanted Absolutely. Yeah. Right. How about uh, Leather Boy? Leather Boy. Leather Boy. And his costume is exactly what you think it is. Absolutely. And it has to be Marvel or DC. It doesn't sound like either. Uh, so, uh, yes, it has to be Marvel or DC. So is it Marvel, DC, or none? I would – oh, it could be none? Yeah, it could be something I, would, I made up. I would say none. And you're wrong. He's actually um, a founding member of the Great Lakes Avengers – but he had no super powers. And I swear this is true. He thought he was answering a personal ad and ended up applying to be part of the Avengers. So, um, sorry, no, no credit on that. Uh, how about Hell Cow? Hell Cow. Hell Cow. DC, Marvel, or none? It's silly. Um, I would say, I would say none. And you're wrong again. It's actually a Marvel character. Uh, it's Bessie the cow who was bitten and turned by Dracula himself who uh, once teamed up with Deadpool. So that sounds like a great Deadpool 3 movie, right? Oh, my gosh. Um, how about uh, Bladder Man? Bladder Man. Oh, my gosh. I think that one of my squires may have been Bladder Man as a – as a as an alternate identity, um, I'm going to say Bladder Man is going to be DC. Uh, no, I made that one up. Oh, so, um, yeah, just going to hold that one in. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, oh, the Brown Fiddleback. That sounds marvelly. They're okay. very into spiders. Okay, so uh, no, I made that one up too. Um, <laughs> how about Arm Fall Off Boy? Arm fall Great name. away. Well, um, it's only a flesh wound. Uh, let's go with DC. You are correct. Now, you want to hear what his power is? I believe his arm probably fell off. He can remove his arms and use them as clubs uh, to batter his opponents. Absolutely. Great. I think I that's, mean, I, we can I'd use like that to, in the SCA. I was going to say, I'd like to see that in Crown Turn. Absolutely. Just as um, an aside, gentlemen, I should let you know that Arm Fall Off Boy is going to be in the next DC film. I oh, kid you not. The Nathan Suicide Squad Korean is supposed to be playing him in uh, in the next uh, DC film. So be nice. be on the lookout for Arm well, Fall Off Boy. You, you got to hand it to him. Um, <sighs> oh no! Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> um, hey, you came on the show and volunteered. Um, <laughs> Just a couple of more. I'm not getting Stone, paid? Uh, uh, as much as you get paid as chairman. Um, right. Stone boy. Stone or stoned? Stone. Stone boy. Um, I'm going to go with DC. Uh, actually, he's Marvel. But uh, he can turn into a stone statue. Well, that's useful. <laughs> Call things light. <laughs> Okay, two more. Uh, All right. Okay. The cunning linguist. Uh, Marvel, okay. DC, Marvel DC are made I will up. say right now, I don't know if you someone has put you up to this, but I actually have used that as an alternate persona to enter a list. I am not kidding. But not I, didn't know, I didn't know that there was such a superhero. So I think that it's going to be none of the above. That's correct. I totally made that one up. Um, that was me, apparently. My, my, was my alter ego. I'm the uh, alter ego. Nice. Yeah, well, there um, we go. I'm not going to talk about that, though. It goes um, with the Rogue and the other things. Yes. Okay. Um, I have two. Let me pick Maggot. The Maggot is Marvel. That is correct. Now, do you remember what his power is? He's a Maggot. He he actually has two slug like he has two slug like creatures named Eenie and Meenie that burst from his digestive tract 
and eat any type of matter and then give mm -hmm. him the power from it. Yes. So he was an X Men villain or something. Yeah, uh, everyone, I hope you're having a good dinner. Um, anyway, you did pretty good. I mean, you only missed a few, but it sounds like I should uh, start writing comic books. There you anyway. go. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so your grace, thank you so much. It, it, it is wonderful to see you. I know our paths have crisscrossed over the years. So, um, but again, thank you for helping navigate us through, and by we, I mean the SCA, through these challenging past year or so, and um, your well deserved uh, exit ramp that's coming oh, I appreciate up. Appreciate that. You guys are in great shape. You're. The, the the new chairman is going is doing an amazing job. The new vice chairman, and I'll tell you what the, you you already mentioned it before. The the president and John Fulton uh, Bear Killer has is the the right man for the job right now. Uh, Renee Signoretti and and Leslie Fulton uh, continue to do an amazing job. I just wanted to tell tell you that you guys that you're in great hands. Great. Well, uh, and and thank you for putting them in the position for our continued success. So, all right. Well, have a great rest of your evening. It was so good to see you. And thank you once again. My have pleasure. a good night. You too. Uh, that was great. I, I, um, as an aside, uh, you've done society level work. Um, I have been on the uh, list for the board of directors two separate times. And uh, luckily enough, my name wasn't called up. Um, but so uh, everyone get those letters in. I would recommend against it, guys. I mean, honestly, it's um, the you, we just know, knowing me, that the meetings would be two hours longer, and we just we can't do that to the rest of them. That's just not fair. Uh, but folks, I recommend it that if you would like to serve the society, um, go on to sca.org, go and take a look at the requirements. Um, at, you may have to brush up your mundane and SCA resumes um, and uh, and and look at the, as he says, a three and a half year commitment. It is not something that this is this is longer than some uh, territorial baron seats and baroness seats uh, last. So it is a, a major, uh, a major thing to undertake in service of the society. But if that is something that is your calling, uh, we spoke with his grace earlier before the show and he'd said that currently uh, he didn't think that there were hardly any guidance on the list. So now might be your time. And, and, and just to the point that he also mentioned, if you know some worthy gentles that may not feel confident writing a letter on their own, that you can, uh, you can write letters and nominating them for consideration too. So, um, yeah, as Bjorn said, go to the sca.org and look for the what they're looking for for your submission. Um, we've been a bit talky, so Bjorn, we need to move on to who, we, who do we have coming next? We have a live performance from, by uh, Mistress Ekaterin from the East Kingdom. Uh, she is phenomenal, and we're very, very fortunate to have her with us so late this evening. Yeah, so let's go ahead and bring her on before she dozes off because it is late out there. Hold on. And here she is. Good evening. Hi. How are oh, you? Thank you for being so patient. I appreciate it. It's interesting. It was very oh, we, listening to his ex. Yeah. I know. We learned a lot about superheroes. So, and <laughs> alternate personas for our former oh. chairman of the board. So, uh, don't think we need to know that part. Anyway. Um, <laughs> How are things out in the East Kingdom tonight? Colder than I would want at this time of year, but it's spring, you know. Right. It's it's still that uh, transitional transitional time. So um, now, uh, just a couple of quick things. How how long have you been in the SCA? I first joined in 1991, so oh. 30 years, or it'll be 30 years this fall. Very nice. So um, that's yeah. quite a long time. Have you always been in the East Kingdom? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I haven't been there a lot. And whereabouts <laughs> in the East Kingdom do you live? I'm in the Shire of Anglesburg, which is um, upstate New York, mundanely. Oh. And um, yeah, I'm kind of near where Massachusetts, New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire all intersect. I'm up near that area there. 
So that's where a lot of people go to watch the changing of the foliage. Oh, right? yeah. Leaf peepers. Yeah, we get lots of leaf peepers up here. See, I, I know things. Um, and then now, for bardic performances, when you started the SCA, or is that what drew you in? Or what, what really um, kind of got you started? Or, or have you grown into that area? What, how did that come about? Um, I almost never perform publicly. Um, mm -hmm. I've been singing since before I could walk. My dad was choir director of our church when I was a little girl. <clears throat> so um, I was always dragged to choir practices and was underfoot uh, when I was little uh, in, in his sessions. And they used to let me pretend to sing before they realized that I actually was singing at like three and four. And um, I always have music going in my head um, and uh, the stuff I actually stopped singing with the choir when I was in my teens uh, for various reasons. Kids do that. They kind of leave their parents' uh, realm, and the church certainly was. Um, but <clears throat> the music that I learned as a kid is what I sang to my children. They were their lullabies. You know, my oldest son is in his 20s now, and he's a musician. Um, and uh, my younger ones can definitely sing and they know this stuff, although they wouldn't sing it. They, ah, eh. But um, <laughs> they have their own stuff that they do. But um, recently, within the last year or so, um, just being so cut off from my SCA family, I've started participating in the Bardics. First, just watching and listening and um, very rarely um, in, in the SCA before this, I would sing. People, probably I can count on my hand the number of people who know that I do perform. So, um, uh, um, before the, the pandemic, anyways. So, it's, so, I love it. So, <clears throat> do you perform? Do you like to, is there a, spurt, a certain type of music you like to perform? Is it uh, original yeah. or is it? No, well, I do some original, but that's not what I'll be doing tonight. Um, I'll be doing some of the Byzantine. I grew up in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and um, I, I found it, um, I've always found the history of the church interesting, and I started looking into the music that I sing and that I know, and I haven't looked at a piece of music with this stuff on it in 30 years. Um, it's just in my head. So what I sing is probably not exactly what's written anymore. Uh, especially the number of late night hours that I sang to my kids. Things get, you know, changed a little bit over time. The words should be the same, um, but the tune will be a little different. Well, um, it's, but, it's personalized, right? So. I guess so, yeah. yeah. Um, but you want to tell us about the first, can you want to tell us about the first piece? Yeah, it's it's one of, um, it's called, so I wrote it down phonetically, Enita um, um, which means, essentially without grace, there is no heaven. Um, and this one goes back uh, to the Syriac tradition, uh, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which is uh, was brought into uh, Byzantium by the patriarchate of that time. Um, it was spread out as the divine liturgy. It was part of it uh, throughout the Eastern, King, the Eastern church, um, probably the whole church really. Um, and later versions of the liturgy were also established and kind of took over and pushed some of the earlier traditions aside. And this one piece has been maintained. It's very, very beautiful. Um, and some of the other stuff that I'll be doing later is part of one of the others. Um, and I haven't researched those quite as much. Um, and I know it has been, uh, it was adapted for modern, modern choirs uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. So some of the phrasing might be slightly different. Some of the notes might be slightly different. But I did find a recording of um, monks singing this, a very, very early version, um, probably quite original, somewhere in the Eastern European region. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody, Nico, yeah, is saying, oh, yeah. Oh, what she's talking about. Cool. Um, and, and it is you can hear the kernel of the piece that I sing, but it's very, very different. Um, so uh, I, I just find it interesting how it's almost like 
in genetics where every generation is slightly different from the from the, the earlier version because of mutations and, and recombinations, how music is the same thing. It, it does definitely change over the um, era and certainly over 1600 years. Um, it's going to change a lot. Right. Um, well, I'll turn the floor over to you for your first piece. Thank you. <clears throat> Beautiful, so nice. Oh my gosh! And, and, and just remember, when people walking, watching at home. You're just singing to a piece of glass, right? It's, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything here. I do acapella. Yeah, so it's it's amazing. So, uh, uh, what's the next piece you want to perform for us tonight? Uh, it's called the Sein Numen. Uh, Sein Numen uh, uh, combined with an Ayos. Um, I don't know how much time I have, so mm -hmm. I can. How much you need? Uh, well. Um, they're um, a more complex piece, and um, I'll, I'll I'll give it a shot. I hope I do it um, justice. I'm, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and the floor is yours. Thank you. to man Don't need to see me. Let me go away. <laughs> Hello, here we go. That was fantastic. Let me uh, let me bring Bjorn in right quick. Hi, Bjorn. 
That was fantastic. Oh, that was thank beautiful. you. Now, thank you. Um, for the folks at home, would you mind, um, just in case they don't know and they're not as familiar with Orthodox liturgy, which admittedly many folks who do study uh, music within the SCA of a liturgical bent, it's usually the Roman rite. So right. would you please let them know what was the language that you were singing in? Oh, that that would have been um, Greek or earlier Greek, uh, not not ancient, certainly not. Um, it's a, it's a Middle Greek from the um, earliest part of the third, fourth, fifth centuries. Um, yeah. So that, that's what I loved about it because there's the ancient Greek, yeah. and then there's the intertestamental biblical Greek yeah. that they write the 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 books the New Testament in, and then there's the Greek of that early portion of the of the Eastern Church that you were that you were singing in, and, yeah. and that is different from Renaissance and now what modern Greek is. So, yeah, but you can see the the lineage of the words, and uh, I it was magnificent. Thank you so much. I, it was Thank truly you. beautiful. Uh, my father taught me to to sing in biblical Greek because he was a New Testament scholar. So for me, oh. that I, I caught more than I thought I was going to. It was really kind of cool, and and it was just uh, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. It was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was all Greek to me, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed your show today, guys. Thank you very much. This was fun. Oh. Well, thank you. And I, I, uh, Ekaterin, I, I encourage you to read the comments after the show wraps. Lots of wonderful things about your Aww. beautiful performance. So Aww. thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yes. It was a pleasure to meet you. It really was. And uh, I, I know you say you don't perform much, but I mean, with the talent that you have, it, it, you really should be out there sharing it more. I, I mean, I'm usually really busy out in the youth list. I'm a youth marshal. I'm the youths. The youths. Youths. Yes, that's my thing. Hey, you hold. Yeah, that's my typical thing. That's that's what people hear me say. Hold. Well, you, you should sing it and just sing. Uh, anyway, yeah. thank you for staying up late with us. It was Bye. a pleasure to meet you. Hopefully, we'll meet in person someday. Thank you very much. Have a good Enjoy the rest of your night, Miss. Thank you so much. Oh, that was gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, it was. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all of my friends in the East Kingdom who continually let me know about folks and like, now, Mrs. Catherine doesn't sing very often, but maybe if you ask real nicely, and she was a delight and she oh, yeah. was very, a very kind and uh, kindly joined us this evening. And uh, so once again, East Kingdom folks, um, thank you so much for sharing things on, on this here coast. We really appreciate it. Yes. Um, yeah, and again, people that are viewing this outside of Kite, if you have recommendations for people we should speak to or performers we should have in, uh, just drop us a note at uh, livefromkite at gmail.com, and we'll get right back with you. So, um, so that pretty much wraps up our show this evening. Um, so let's talk about who we have coming up for the next couple of weeks for the interviews. Well, next week, uh, we've lined up... Uh, the VP of Operations and Member Services for the SCA, the soon to be retiring Renee. So if you've ever pulled insurance or, hey, where's my card or any of that, you have interfaced with Renee. She's been there forever. So now she's announced her retirement. We're gonna to talk to her about the experiences, uh, what they're looking for, for a replacement even, and how you would go about even throwing your name in the hat or your ring in the hat or your name into the bowl. I, I'm going to stop just there. Uh, and then um, I, it's one of those days. I mean, look at my hair. I mean, obviously, look at that. Um, this and one, then, hats and coifs. I, yes, I, 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 I learned I my should, lesson. I should just wear a mask for the whole show. Uh, and then the following week, two weeks from night, we, we will have the councils of the East Kingdom. That's why their majesties will be here talking about um, their reign and also the um, rather unique solution they've come up with for holding crown tournament between two, with a kingdom that straddles the national northern border. How's that for a way to phrase that? Um, so that, we're very lucky to have them on here. Um, I think it'll be a very enlightening discussion with their majesties. Uh, and uh, Bjorn, do we have, a, who do we have coming up Bardic-wise? Well, as I had mentioned during the ANS portion, we have a Bardic 
war that's coming up. And so in keeping with their folks and talking with them and also continue to hype up the next month, it looks like that the Mid-Rome general, the Atlantean general, and the uh, general of the West, plus the two autocrats will be coming on at various portions in the next month or so. So we're going to be having a lot of different folks from a lot of different pl places that will be talking uh, to us and then performing for us. So we're really excited. Plus, honestly, I I think it's great that they're also using our show as as a as a chance to practice a little bit before war because you know you you wanna you wanna make sure that you peak at the right time. We talked about that at the beginning of the show. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and hopefully their performances will be talking smack about the other side of the war. Because, well, if they happen. follow what you do with Aiden Veld, I'm sure they will. Oh, oh, you had to mention. Anyway, so well, that wraps up our show for this evening. Uh, again, Bjorn, thank you for joining us this week. Uh, pleasure as always. Thank you again. Glad to be here. All righty, and for everyone else watching us, be sure to join us again next week when we will once again be live. live. From Kai. See you then.